My name is Marcel Wernand. And I'm Oliver Zielinski. We are interested in how much light is available in the sea and what color this light has at different depths. This means that through our research we get a closer look at the subsurface spectral light field and the mechanisms within the marine environment. Through a new project we are investigating a possible trend of decreasing transparency in our coastal waters over the past century. More about this project later. First we will serve back in time. Our story begins in 1676 with Captain John Wood and his never repeated observation of an extreme transparent sea. Captain John Wood was trying to find a northeast passage to the Orient. When he sailed close to Nova Zembla, he saw from the deck of a ship the speedwell, the bottom at the depth of around 140 meters. Literally, he writes, The sea water about the ice and land is very salt and much salter than I ever yet tasted and a great deal heavier and I may certainly say the clearest in the world. By mentioning that the water is very salty we can now say that the region was possibly influenced by very clear saline uh, ocean water. Shortly after Wood's observation the frigate Speedwell shipwrecked but John Wood survived. He later named this unfortunate place Point Speedill. Strangely enough, Wood's observation in the Barents Sea never has been repeated. Uh, natural waters, oceans, seas, lakes and rivers have their own distinct color. But from above, it is less easy to see how clear the water is. In crystal clear water, we see the bottom and we are fascinated by living objects, pathing along our eyes, in more turbid green waters, the colored waters, nobody will think about its clearness. What happened after Wood's observation? Well, lots of instruments and strange objects were developed and used by scientists and explorers over centuries to establish the transparency of the sea. First, they were used for navigation, uh, for an early detection of cliffs in the Blue Sea, then out of curiosity and much later for the sake of science. Around 1864, the scientist, cleric and astronomer at the Vatican, Pietro Angelo Secchi and Alexandro Chialdi, sailed the Tyrrhenian Sea to investigate different methods to determine the transparency of the sea. Experimenting with different disk materials, colors and diameters, and they noted also the clearness of the sky and the altitude of the sun, Finally, this was the work which oceanographers and limnologists were waiting for. It was the first systematic approach to determine the transparency of the sea. The method, lowering a white painted disc of 30 centimeters in diameter in, into the water column until it disappeared, was established in 1865. And this method is still in use. Their experiments were described in Il Nuovo Cimento, the Italian journal of physics and chemistry. The method was named after Secchi and the measurement was noted as Secchi disc depth in meters. It was the depth where the disc disappears out of sight. The water visibility record observed by Captain John Wood in 1676 in the vicinity of Nova Zimbra still stands. However, Winfried Gieskes, a Dutch oceanographer, lowered a Secchi disc 30 centimeters in diameter around noon in the eastern Weddell Sea, Antarctica. It was on October 13, 1986, and he lowered it to a depth of 79 meters. And this is now the official Secchi disc depth record. From that time on, worldwide, 650,000 Secchi disc observations were performed. Water clarity and water color are two parameters that were measured over a long time, over more than 100 years. For measuring the color of the ocean, we use the forel uhle scale. Using this scale, which is 21 colors varying between indigo blue, think of the ocean, and cola brown, uh, an inland lake, the observer can compare it against the color of the sea over a secchi disc. Worldwide, over 250,000 color observations were made over the past century. Within our new research project called 
coastal ocean darkening, we are aiming to use historic observations of both water clarity and water color, and we like to link them to modern scientific methods, uh, working with advanced radiometers, satellite sensors, as well as computer simulations. Oliver will now tell you all about this project. Thanks, Marcel. Let me briefly explain the concept of the project. The Coastal Ocean Darkening project started in August 2016 and will last for at least four years. It's coordinated by the Institute for Chemistry and Biology of the Marine Environment at the Oldenburg University and is performed in cooperation with the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research, NEOS. Within this project, we want to connect the past with the future. First, we cover the history of the past 100 years. Then we look into the mechanisms between light and biology in present times. And finally, we project our knowledge 100 years into the future. Here, we see an annual mean Secidus depth observation of the North Sea over the past 120 years. Looking at the clarity in the last century, you can see a clear trend towards a darker and more turbid sea. However, from 2000 onward, we see an opposite trend. It is getting clearer again. And similar changes we find in many coastal oceans around the globe. This is a real mystery. The drivers of these changes could be manifold, from storms as a result of climate change, more fishery, especially trawling on the seabed, more nutrients in the water as a result of fertilizers from agriculture and human sewage. But these are currently just speculations. Until now, it is a mystery why we see a darkening over the past century. In the next step, we aim to come up with a model for the spectral light field that one can observe underwater. Therefore, we apply modern hyperspectral radiometers as well as computer simulations and we link both of them with the substances that we find in the water column. The most relevant substance in the water, if not for all life on this planet, is phytoplankton, also known as algae. They are the lungs of the ocean and every second breath that we take can be attributed to marine algae. They are also the fundamental food supply of all higher species in the marine realm. However, what will happen to the phytoplankton if there is less light available in the sea? Finally, we will look into the future of a highly dynamic coastal ocean. And the scientific way to achieve this is by setting up a computer model that contains our present understanding of the interactions between light and the essential elements of the ocean. To illustrate how models can help us to look at larger scales, you can see here how the light availability evolves over one year in the southern North Sea. You can see the time evolving from January through December. Wherever we have bright areas, light reaches the bottom. You can easily see that light availability is not homogeneous across the North Sea. In some areas, like for example the Dogger Bank, are more exposed than other regions. Combining these models with a prediction of the global and regional climate evolution, we are challenged to find out if the coastal ocean darkening is continuing, stagnating or even recovering. This is the mystery that we aim to clarify within our Coastal Ocean Darkening project. Are you as curious as we are? What the answers will be? Please keep updated and visit our website clarityonthesea.org.